So who, who likes sci-fi? <laughs> I'm a big sci-fi geek. Um, I don't think I even need an introduction. I think this, uh, I think this is like the, the, the realm where sci-fi becomes real. Um, and, uh, and Alan's gonna, is gonna talk to us about pioneering in Mars, <laughs> which I'm really excited about. Welcome to the stage, Helen. There's a bit of a delay. Okay, great, okay, thanks. Hi. Um, so, what does the head of the Israeli Space Agency, uh, the uh, particle size specialist at Tevas Pharmaceuticals, and uh, the VP operations of El Al all have in common? They're all on my speed dial. Um, and that is because of uh, Bubble Base, which I'm really excited to tell you about. It's a project uh, to develop technology to uh, 3D print houses on Mars uh, for the NASA Centennial Challenge. So people often ask me, um, why or how did you get into 3D printing houses on Mars? Uh, and that's <laughs> a great question. Um, so uh, I moved to Jerusalem when I was 10. Uh, I went to school here in Jerusalem at the Israel Arts and Science Academy. Uh, I, I uh, participated in the MEET program, uh, doing computer science. Then I was a fitness instructor in Talpiot, also here in Jerusalem. Uh, did my architecture degree at Bitzalel. Uh, worked uh, as an architect briefly, uh, then worked in VC as a tech analyst, managed the JNext High Tech Fund for the city of Jerusalem, um, and uh, most recently I was at the International Space University. Uh, I was then actually supposed to go to Harvard for my master's, uh, but decided uh, to not do that, and instead uh, to keep working uh, on this project for NASA, which I'm going to tell you about now. Uh, so basically, if we kind of sum up up this whole process of kind of how I got to where I am today. I like to tell people I went from anti-tech to architect to architect, really working at the intersection of, of these two fields. So it started uh, with my final thesis uh, in Bitzalel. I was working uh, really from a high level conceptual standpoint. I was interested in the urbanization uh, of what it looks like to plan a city uh, where there's nothing. And Mars is a great place to, to start doing that. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that's kind of how I got started. And I was working at my project uh, for Bitzalel for my final thesis. And there just happened to be a call for proposals from NASA for a uh, proposal for 3D printing houses on Mars. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. I've been working on this for six months. Um, I should submit a proposal. So I called up my friend uh, Lior, who was founding a 3D printing company. And I said, Lior, there's this NASA competition. Can you help me make my stuff sound a little more engineering, and we can submit something to, to NASA? Um, so he's like, yeah, sure. So he sat and we worked on it one weekend. We had to send in a two-pager. Uh, and we sent in our two-pager to NASA. Uh, and they liked it. And they said, OK, send in, the, uh, send in a five-pager. Send in a 10-pager. Um, come to New York with your 3D printed model. Um, so that was the NASA Centennial Challenge. Um, so we came to New York. Uh, they really liked our two-pager and five-pager and ten-pager, in part because uh, it was a comic book. Um, everyone else uh, sent in technical reports. Uh, I drew a comic book for NASA. Um, <laughs> so it was... <laughs> Um, so they really liked it. Uh, the concept here uh, was basically to have a high performance uh, inflatable structure uh, that we were sending there. And because of the difference in atmospheric pressure with a very small amount of gas, you could inflate the structure. And then we were filling that with solar sintered sand. Um, so basically uh, melting the sand and using that as the construction material and then having a, a dome of solar sintered bricks on top of that. Uh, and the reason that you want to do this is because uh, you want to use local materials on Mars. Uh, because it's really, really expensive to transport materials. It's about, uh, th it's about uh, three, almost $3 million per kilo to send stuff to Mars. Uh, and so you definitely don't want to be shipping building materials there. Um, so then we had to send our model uh, to New York. Um, that was like a whole uh, fun operation. Uh, we, we need, it was a pretty decent sized uh, model that we had to 3D print. Uh, we asked um, 
Autodesk and Strategies if they're willing to print it for us. And they said, you know, Helen, this is a 40-hour print. We can't just, you know, stop everything to print it. Uh, but you, you're really lucky because it's about to be Rosh Hashanah. We can leave it in over the holidays. Nobody's supervising, but like it might come out okay. We'll come after the holiday and see if it works. Um, good thing we did that with two places. One worked, one didn't. Uh, we then uh, called in some favors with someone's ex-girlfriend who was on uh, was a. a a dayelet, it was a stewardess on the a stewardess um, on the a flight attendant. Sorry, and she uh, basically got got set on the right flight, uh, and then met us at the airport and made sure that our thing got on the on the plane because it wasn't the right size. Um, so we got our model to New York. That was great. And then uh, we show up in New York with our uh, 3D printed model, and we look like right and left, and we see that we're competing against a Pritzker Prize winning architects uh, like Norman Foster and MIT and all these teams of PhD scientists. And we're just like, oh my god. Um, and uh, we, I mean, built this at Lior's mom's house in Poleg in the basement. Um, and uh, we did pretty well. We won an honorable mention uh, in the first phase of the competition. Uh, so that was exciting. We got a little PR here in Israel. And then uh, on to the next phase of the competition, it was uh, material engineering. So neither of us knew anything about material engineering. So we kind of were like, OK, well, this is great. We have a nice line for our CV. Um, I went back to managing the fund. Lior went back to his startup. Um, but through my work at JNext, I met uh, Professor Shlomo Magdasi and Dr. Michele Yani, who specialize in developing new materials for 3D printing. Um, so I met Michael. I said, hey, Michael, there's this NASA competition thing. We weren't thinking of going to the next phase, but like, you know about material science. What do you think? Maybe you can help us work on this. So he looks at the rules, and he comes back to me, and he's like, Helen, the deadline is in six weeks. I'm like, yeah, that's plenty of time. He's like, no, you don't understand. You don't make new materials in six weeks. You spent like a year making a new material. Um, but you're really lucky because I've been working on something very close to this field of research for the past year. So I'm like, OK, great. Um, so then I start working with Michael. He's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to work, but get me some Mars dust because I need to try it out in the lab. So I call up the one and only Martian geologist in Israel, Roe, and I'm like, Roe, where do I get Mars dust? Um, and Roe says, um, well, you can buy it from the, the lab, but it, like, it takes time to get here. It comes from the US. Uh, or you can just go to the Golan and get some crust basalt rock with 57% silica. I'm like, OK, great, let's do that. Uh, <laughs> so we got some crushed basalt rock. Um, and we, were print we wanted to print our cylinder. Um, oh, the numbers jumped. Oh, well. Um, so we were going to print the cylinder. Uh, and we were going to use the printer in Professor Magdasi's laboratory, except that the printer broke uh, two weeks before the deadline. Um, so I thought, you know what? If we don't have that printer, we should borrow someone else's printer. So I'm making calls to everyone I know who owns a potentially relevant printer. Um, and people are not so excited to let you use um, weird materials in their million dollar printer when it's going to um, void the warranty. Um, so I didn't find anyone who was willing to give me their 3D printer um, for this. So then I said, OK, well, if we can't borrow a 3D printer, we'll have to build one. Um, we still have zero budget uh, and two weeks before the deadline. Uh, so we borrowed a, a robotic arm. It's like a $100,000 robotic arm. We borrowed it from the importer of robotic arms into Israel, and we went to use it in his showroom in Haifa. Uh, and then we borrowed a pasta machine from the uh, Science Museum, from the Bloomfield Science Museum, because we needed basically the robotic arm provides the movement function, but the pasta machine uh, provides the extrusion function. So I, ideally, we would have bought like really nice clay-based extruders, uh, which would push the material out, but we couldn't afford that. So we used the pasta machine instead. So we fed Mars dust into the pasta machine. Um, so here we're collecting um, some uh, crushed basalt rock. Uh, here's our first pasta machine. Um, we uh, built an extension here to make it bigger. Um, we uh, fried the motor in our first pasta machine. Um, and uh, Isaac Hassan, who is here, generously bought us a new pasta machine. Um, <laughs> The other problem was that our material was highly flammable, um, and that there were only three importers of this material into Israel, uh, and they were all out of the chemical that we needed. Uh, so we basically went around to different labs at the Hebrew University, and we're like, mm, can we have 100 milliliters? Can we have 200 milliliters? Like collecting this, this chemical um, to be able to uh, 3D print. We still didn't have enough, so we actually had to dilute our recipe. Uh, and you can see here that the, um, the print is not that accurate in the dimensions mentions of it, it's, uh, but what, what was uh, really amazing was that it worked, right? So, um, so we uh, 3D printed the cylinder, and we sent it to a compression test. 
And in the compression test, it had to uh, withstand a minimum of 450 kilo, and we withstood about uh, times three that. So that was really exciting. Um, and then we sent the broken pieces to NASA for analysis. Um, so that was the first stage. The second stage, uh, that uh, again, uh, in kind of in line with our uh, style and look and feel of everything, we did that whole documentation of this process uh, in a comic, comic book uh, for NASA. So we sent them the comic book, uh, kind of demonstrating our process and all the things we went through. Uh, and what's unique about our approach versus some of the other ones is that um, we uh, are not using polymers in our recipe, so we're not using plastics, because you don't have plastics on Mars. And so even if you're using mostly Mars dust and a little bit of plastic, that plastic adds up when you're sending it to Mars, right? Uh, and so we're, we're using 100% local materials that can be found and sourced on Mars. Um, what you see, so that's kind of our big differentiation. Uh, again, like I mentioned, it's really expensive to send stuff to Mars, and also there's risk issues around potentially having to, uh, you know, send materials over there versus being able to source uh, materials there. So then we went on to the next phase of uh, 3D printing a beam. So. 3D printing a beam, at this point I was already at International Space University, um, and I called the director of um, the Israeli Space Agency, Avi, I call him up and I say, Avi, this is Helen, the crazy person printing houses on Mars, remember me. Um, so remember I told you a month ago that we're dropping out of the competition because we don't have funding uh, for chemicals? Now I'm like really serious. Like if we don't have 27,000 shekels in the next four days to buy 60 liters of chemicals, it's just not feasible. Like, it can't happen. You're not going to have an Israeli team in the NASA Centennial Challenge. So he's like, okay, Helen, let me make some phone calls. So I get an email from him at 10 o'clock at night saying, call Yossi in the morning. Okay, so I call Yossi. Yossi's the founder of a startup. Um, and Yossi says, I love what you guys are doing. I'm going to buy you the chemicals. What's your address? I'll send you the chemicals. I'm like, okay, great, thanks. Um, so then I call this up this other investor who had... Um, I call up this other investor uh, who was willing to match. I said, so I, ha I don't have anyone to match exactly with, but this guy's buying us chemicals. How about you match with that? He's like, OK, I'm in for 5K. So I'm like, OK, beautiful. Um, so at this point, I now have enough money to buy my clay-based extruders. So I'm really excited. So I call up the factory in Italy, and I'm like, guys, can you ship the extruders today? I really need them. And the, the lady's like, Helen, we don't have them, we have to make them. I'm like, what do you mean you have to make them? It's listed on your website. She's like, yeah, we don't have any, we have to make them. It's gonna take us two months. I'm like, no, I don't have two months, I have a deadline in two weeks. She's like, well, if we do this, if we do ones that are like not a custom model, that it's more similar, we can get it down to uh, a week. I'm like, no, that's not fast enough. So I call up the engineering department and have someone translate to Italian for me. I'm talking, I, got, I convinced the engineers that they can do it in two days. So then I call back management and I'm like, okay, so your engineers can do it faster. Um, so I I negotiated her down to two days, and then um, a day and a half in, I call her and I'm like, look, um, we have a friend, he's a pilot, he's flying out of Milan, if you finish a little bit earlier, then we can have them, but they'll bring it Friday afternoon on this flight, uh, it's 40 kilos of industrial extruders, it's not, I mean, we're going to lose the weekend because of FedEx, um, so she's like, okay, we'll finish it sooner, and I'm like, okay, how the hell do I get these 40 kilos of extruders from this uh, factory in northern Italy down to the Milan airport? Well, when, like everything else, when you don't know what to do in life, um, you write a post on Facebook. Um, so we put a post in the Israeli students in Italy in their Facebook group. Hi, this is Helen. Um, I need someone to please do me a huge favor and bring this box of extruders uh, to the airport. We'll pay you 100 euro. Thank you, thank you. Um, and this girl uh, answers, this girl Yana, answers and she's like I love your project and I'm gonna help you um, we're like okay great so I we, again I'm at Space University I'm waking up every morning at like 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning to make phone calls before I go to class at 8 so I get up at 6 um, and uh, one of my partners Daniel is with me at Space University uh, and the other one is here Ariel um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> Uh, so me and Daniel are waking up to work on this and we see Yana wrote us a message and we're like, okay, well, we have to wake Yana up because if she doesn't leave in the next half hour, she's never going to get to the airport in time. So we're calling Yana on Facebook, texting her, she's not answering, the poor girl's sleeping. So I see that I have one mutual friend with her in Israel. So I call the guy in Israel and wake him up and I'm like, Roe, please tell me that you have Yana's phone number. 
And he's like, Helen, is this an emergency? I'm like, no, it's not an emergency. Just give me Yana's phone number. Um, so I, uh, I call Yana. I wake her up. I'm like, hi, Yana. This is Helen from Facebook. Um, I really need you to wake up and go get our box of extruders, like now. Um, and she wakes up and she says, oh, no, my boyfriend took the car. Uh, so I said, Yana, rent a car, steal a car, borrow a car, take a taxi. I don't care what you do. I'll reimburse you. Just please get me my box of extruders. Um, so uh, Yana drives with her friend to get our box of extruders. I get a call from her about two hours later saying, um, Helen, you know it hasn't gone through Italian customs, right? They're not going to let you fly out with this. And it usually takes two days to go through customs. But don't worry, I've already faxed them the forms, and I'm on my way over there. I'm like, oh, great, thanks, Yana. <laughs> um, so meanwhile, we missed the flight. And um, so at this point, uh, then someone uh, makes introductions to, uh, to LL, to like senior management there. I already have like a WhatsApp group with the VP operations and his PA <laughs> and the ground operations in Fumocino. Um, and so uh, I, I said, guys, so we missed the flight. Can you put it on the next flight? And they're like, well, Helen, if you don't personally know the pilot, you're going to have to fly someone with it. This is a security issue. You can't just fly 40 kilos of extruders. You have to, you have to fly someone on the pl plane with it. Um, so I call back Yana. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, so Yana, right? You haven't visited your family in Israel for a while. Um, we'd really like to buy you a ticket and fly you here tomorrow with our box of extruders. Um, so luckily, Yana's um, open-minded and flexible. Um, so uh, we put Yana on the flight. Um, there you go. Sorry. OK, so we put Yana on a flight. Uh, and we get here to Israel. And we um, are using a 3D printer at Autodesk. Uh, and we're connecting our extruders to that uh, and our infrared drying process and our compression pump uh, on this kind of infrastructure uh, XYZ gantry printer uh, at Autodesk. And um, then I get a call saying, um, you know, Helen, I'm still in Ireland. I say, Helen, Helen, you know, we close at 6. And you can't stay here after that. I'm like, what do you mean this is a 15-hour continuous print? You can't close at 6. Uh, and they're like, we're sorry, we close at 6. And like, you, I, well, can I have your printer? No, you can't take the printer out of the building. I said, aha, you can't take it out of the building. But Autodesk in Tel Aviv is Rothschild 22. It's also a hotel. So I said, how about if we rent a hotel room and take the printer up to the hotel? Technically, it's not leaving the building. Um, <laughs> So um, we rented a hotel room and kidnapped their printer. Um, and uh, that was also really good because there's like regulatory issues around like chemicals and which chemicals you can use in their printing space and blah, blah, blah. And you don't have any of those problems in a hotel room. Nobody really asks like what you're doing. <laughs> so that was good. Um, so here you can see uh, our printer in the hotel room. Uh, you can see already that the print here is a lot more accurate uh, because of our fantastic extruders. Um, here's uh, Arielle in the bathroom mixing Mars dust. Uh, <laughs> the five-star hotel. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, there was some issue at some point. We were uh, running out of uh, Mars dust because uh, FedEx screwed up one of our shipments. And we had a whole bo box of Mars dust that was stuck in Italy. Um, and so uh, and, and like th things weren't going well. We wanted to bring in kind of backup for our yell. So uh, we, we decided that we need to fly Daniel from International Space University in Ireland to fly him uh, to Israel to kind of uh, help with the printing. Uh, and so we, I'm sitting in class basically, and we order a, and, and I'm sitting in class like ordering this flight, uh, and we're like, well, if you leave now, you can get, you can get to the only flight today. Um, so I'm ordering the flight as he's like running to get his passport from the dorms, um, and uh, we get him on the flight. Meanwhile, I'm on the phone with Elal for getting the other box of Mars dust. I'm like, guys, I'm sorry, I don't have anyone else to send from Italy. Can you please just like take my Mars dust with like nobody on the flight? Um, and they're like, well, give us a letter from the professor and from the space agency, and we'll get special like security approval. We'll try. Um, so um, 
they, they pull it off. It was miraculous. They get my box of Mars dust on the flight. Um, the Mars dust lands in the Tel Aviv airport at 4 a.m. Daniel lands at 5 a.m. I give El Al his flight information, and they match him with the Mars dust at the airport, like where they put all the strollers. So it was like strollers <laughs> and Mars dust. Um, so that was great. Uh, <laughs> and here uh, we have kind of another parallel process. We kept a factory open on the weekend to uh, try and source more local Mars dust and kind of sift through that. Um, so that was the whole kind of flying operation. Um, and then we, um, so that was exciting. Uh, and then we had to get this thing to, we had to get the 3D print uh, to NASA, right? Uh, we had to get them the broken pieces in time. So I called back my people at LL and I'm like, guys, I'm really sorry. This is the last favor, I promise. Um, I need you to bring this 65 centimeter beam on the flight tonight, f the direct flight from uh, Tel Aviv to Boston, um, and it has to go in the cockpit because it's not dry yet. You can't put it underneath. Uh, and they're like, well, well let's, check w let's check with the pilot if he's willing to do that. So um, luckily, the pilot was really fantastic and helpful. So we brought the thing to his, uh, we brought the thing to the, uh, to the airport, um, and we got it on the flight. I had a team member at uh, MIT who picked up uh, the, the sample. And uh, we paid off the testing facility to stay open on the weekend. Um, and so he gets there, he picks up the thing, and he, open, he takes it to the testing facility and opens the box. And he's like, Helen, it's not dry. Like, I can't press it. If I press it now, it's not going to work. And I'm like, and then he's like, but don't worry. I, I, um, don't worry. I, they have an oven here, and I convinced them to bake it overnight. And we're going to come back at 5 AM and press it. And then I'm going to get a flight to. Uh, I'm going to get on a flight to Chicago and rent a car so we can get it to Peoria, Illinois by the end of the day, because that was the deadline. So I'm like, OK, great. So they go, they press it. I get a call from, from them after they, uh, from the compression facility. And he's like, Helen, I have bad news. We failed the compression test. It didn't, it didn't like, withstand the minimum required from NASA. It wasn't dry. I'm really sorry. So then I'm like devastated at this point. I drove everyone crazy, like the head of the space agency, Alal, my previous bosses, like everybody. Um, and so I'm like really upset. And then I kind of think about it. I'm like, you know what? What do you do when your technology is just like, it's not good enough? Business development. <laughs> so luckily, I was at the International Space University. Uh, and the guy who was there lecturing that day was like head of everything everything Mars at NASA. So I grabbed him after his lecture at the cocktail party in Ireland. And I'm like, so John, you know the NASA Centennial Challenge for 3D printing? Um, so we just submitted something, but it wasn't exactly what we were supposed to submit. Um, what do you think? Do you think they'll still let us go to the next phase of the competition? Uh, and he's like, just explain that it's like, that it was because of time and money, but that your technology concept is really sound, and they might let you go to the next level. So I, I uh, talked to him. I talked to head of legal at NASA. I talked to people at the Marshall Space Center. Basically, kind of anyone who would listen to me, I'm like, hey, guys, we really want to stay in this competition. Um, so we're not sure. Um, we're not sure what worked exactly, uh, but something worked uh, because three days later, we got a phone call saying, so you guys didn't do exactly what you were supposed to, um, but we'll, we'll still let you come to the next phase of the competition in August if you bring us a real R&D plan and show like, how you're going to fix this stuff by August. Or you can just come for the level three of the competition, uh, for the phase three, and just re like, re rejoin the competition then. So we're like, OK, great. Thanks, this is awesome. We'll rejoin in level three, because we don't have a robotic arm in the US anyway to come do uh, come do the thing at the end of August. Um, so that's where we're at. And actually, NASA uh, had a, they put out an RFI, like a request for information, where they basically put a draft of what they think the rules will look like for the next phase of the competition. And they gave the teams the opportunity to give feedback on the rules. Um, so that was awesome. Um, and so we're going to have, it looks like we're going to have for the next two years for NASA for this competition. Um, the other thing I, I always like to tell people uh, is that our team is uh, predominantly based here in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and I think there's something really special uh, about the different perspective of time here in Jerusalem. And because we're surrounded by all of this history and historic depth, I think it, uh, the time perception is distorted. And it enables us to think differently about the future and to think further into the future. Um, 
so we're all uh, in Jerusalem, which is great. Uh, I'm really happy to be back here. I just got back two days ago. Um, and uh, so we talked at the beginning about who's, uh, who was on my uh, speed dial um, before. But uh, where I am today, I never could have imagined that this is where I would have been if you had asked me uh, two years ago what I would be doing. Um, and who knows who's going to be on my speed dial next year, maybe Elon Musk, I don't know. Uh, but um, but that, that's what we're up to. Um, and I invite uh, people to reach out to me or to Ariel, who is here uh, with me, my co-founder, uh, if you want, are interested in uh, volunteering on the project, either in the capacity of uh, engineers, uh, people with skills in Grasshopper. Uh, we're thinking potentially of doing a crowdfunding campaign, so designers who would be interested in helping uh, with the video assets and things around that. Uh, we're always looking for people who are excited about going to Mars and uh, want to work with us on the, on the project. Uh, computer vision as well. Um, so please come talk to me and Ariel uh, after. And uh, thanks. <laughs>
So our chemicals are pretty expensive. I'm not sure that that would actually lower the prices. Um, but we are looking at earth-based applications for the technology because we're interested in uh, really building, potentially building a business around this. Uh, and so then uh, Mars is pretty far out, so based business model that's happening sooner. Um, and in that context, we're looking potentially at the disaster housing relief uh, because we think that people might be willing to pay a premium on getting things fast in a disaster situation and if you're able to use local materials and minimize the amount that you're transporting in and out of a disaster zone, there might be a potential use case there. Yeah? Is this your full-time job now? <laughs> uh, yes. So it's good. What? You have to get paid in order to call it a job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mostly it costs me money, um, but hopefully at some, at some point uh, I'll be able to get a normal salary from this as well. Um, but basically I, I left my job to um, to go to Space University and then Harvard, uh, and then decided not to go to Harvard to that. So I've been uh, working on this full time since the beginning of the semester. Yeah. Um, first of all, in Elon we Musk, very nice. <laughs> um, do, do you think uh, like like a moon base is going to happen first, or is that necessary to happen first? Or and then also like are, are the applications for these materials is that because it's too totally is this going to be universal? So to speak? Okay, so those are amazing questions. Um, I just picked up 50 pounds of lunar regolith from NASA Ames like a week and a half ago, uh, moon dust, uh, because we want to uh, try and uh, see if our recipe works with moon dust as well. Uh, academically, the material scientists think it will, but they want to get their hands on some material and see if it actually does work. Um, so we think it'll be relevant also for the moon. Uh, I think a very high likelihood that a moon uh, settlement or a moon base would happen before Mars, which is why we're kind of starting to experiment with moon dust as well. Um, and there's uh, actually, hasn't been published yet, but there's a notable uh, satellite company owner who's interested in doing a private moon base uh, and is kind of looking at it from a real estate perspective. Um, and uh, so yeah, there's definitely some discussions happening. It'll still be a few years. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. Uh, yeah. I already asked. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, um, so you mentioned a lot of people that help you uh, during this process. So are they all like officially part of the team, or like who, who's on your team now? Who's actually doing this, um, working on it full, full time, or some time? Yeah, so uh, most of the team is still working on it part-time in various capacities. Um, so Ariel is here. Uh, we have another team member, uh, Lior, uh, who's uh, coming back from MIT in two months. Uh, another person, uh, Daniel, at the Caltech, doing his PhD in robotics at Caltech. Uh, we're working with Professor Magdasi and uh, Dr. Michaleani on the materials side. Uh, and actually, most recently, uh, we recruited um, we recruited a project manager uh, from the air who has like 20 years experience managing aerospace projects uh, who's uh, coming out of retirement to help us. So that's great. I call him the responsible adult on the team. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, in a general startup, they say move fast and break things. Um, that's not the case in space. If you move fast and break things, um, you kill people and it costs a billion dollars. Um, and so it's really important to work with people who have a lot of experience and, and insight into these things. Last question? Yeah, in the back. Um, you've been very inspiring in your lecture. Uh, everything that has to do with uh, science and architecture, that's inspiring. Have you dealt with the ethical part of your project? Meaning we're kind of doing a good job destroying this. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about actually making structures? Another thing. Uh, I think we want to diversify our planetary portfolio. Um, and I agree that we're ruining this planet. And I think it would be great to have a backup planet in case things go south here. <laughs> and with that, we'll wrap up. <laughs>